awesome. <laughs> um, how many people here know that if you're not limiting your work in progress, you're not, you don't have a Kanban? That's also awesome. <laughs> Uh, so this is one of the things that we run into all the time is people say, well, I put up a board and I'm tracking my work on the board, I have a Kanban. It's like, well, no, because you're doing 750 things at the same time. And so basically what happens when you're doing a bunch of things at the same time is your brain gets really pissed off. And then when your brain gets pissed off, you start creating crappy products, which means you're undermining your ability to be a good Craftsman, keep that, that thing in there. So what we'd like to do is set up what's called a Kaizen culture. I know you can't read it, but there. now you can all read it. Uh, and Kaizen basically is shorthand for continuous improvement. We want to make build cultures of continuous improvement. So one of the reasons that we have the Kanban board or that we use it as a tool, and it seems to work fairly well universally, is because it does one thing and one thing only, and that's constantly broadcast what's really going on. And oddly enough, understanding what's really going on helps people make good decisions. Right. Um, So I'm going to skip the Kanban 101, and I'm going to go into a couple of anti-patterns that I've noticed recently. So the first one is um, being told what to do. This is the I like to be exploited uh, anti-pattern. Uh, so one of the things I've seen with Agile and Lean teams is they will invent new roles for people to take responsibility away from them. And so one of the, the most important one of those is called the product owner. So the product owner in Scrum is basically a person who, you know, shields the team so that they can get their work done so that they're not bothered by the business. But oddly enough, we go to work to actually be part of a business. So this seems like an anti-pattern to me. There was a... Um, a recent, one of my friends recently went through an interview process for a job. And they wanted him to be a scrum master. They said, they said, we want you to be a strong scrum master. And he's like, what's a strong scrum master? And they said, well, we have this product owner that keeps injecting new features into the middle of a sprint. And they said, he said, well, why is he doing that? And they said, he's not supposed to do that. And he's like, yeah, but. Can you just tell me why he's doing it? Well, he's not supposed to do that. We want you to stand up to him. So no one ever bothered to find out if there was actually a systemic reason for that person to be injecting work into the middle of the sprint. You know, were there rate, was that person a really lousy planner? Was that person getting pressure from other parts of the business? Was the context of the business changing on a regular basis? Were there uh, defects in the software? Was there technical debt that regularly needed to be dealt, dealt with? You know, nobody knew. All they knew is that they were mad because they weren't following the rules of Scrum. So number two, anti-pattern for me, is uh, just tell me what to do. So I've had lots of teams that I've worked with where people say to me, you know, I'm just really tired of discussing process. I, I just want someone to tell me what to do. And if someone asks you to tell them what to do, there's only one thing you know for sure. They don't know what to do. Right? So one of the reasons that we want to have a board is to say, here's the work that's coming up. Here's the work that we've done. Here's the work that's completed. So, you know, we've got our little board like this. And no, I can't hold this up in the air, I'm sorry. Um, let's say we have this backlog here. What we don't want is to say, you know, this backlog is finite and it cannot change. And what we also don't want to say is, you know, so right now this is what's happening. 
is these people who want to be told what to do, they're out there where all you guys are, and I'm, I'm a manager, and every so often, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and people have like no context for what they're doing or why. So what I want to do is say, you know, here's this crap that's coming up. It's not rocket science, it's just, it's, you know, it's the backlog that we all agree at some point or another is going to be relevant. Here it comes. And here's what you're doing. And I'll just make sure they don't look like a hypocrite and we'll give a work in progress limit there. Um, so here's the stuff that you're doing. And then when you are finished with something, you now have the freedom to be a craftsman and to pick what you want to do next from these things that are important. And this is the cool thing here, is that now all of a sudden, we don't, have, we don't have too much work, we're not overloaded, we're not waiting for somebody else to tell us what to do. We have capacity, and we're going to pull something in from this backlog, right? And we're using our professional judgment to figure out what it is that we are going to pull in. This, this does not sound threatening to me, but you would not believe how much it threatens certain people. So I pull this in, and then this gets finished, and then maybe you know I'll pull this in later, or somebody else will pull that in. There is now a contextual flow of work. And if that horrible, evil product owner from the previous story says, aha, I have something else to inject, it just, you know, you can stick things in here all day long. It doesn't matter because, you know, a lot of conversation. They'll say, no, this thing's really important. And now this is just part of the flow of work. These are all just pieces of value. We don't have to. So this is the thing. That, this, is, this was the hard realization for me after starting a company and doing literally millions of dollars in business in Agile projects was that I had railed against waterfall, and then I had created agile systems that created little tiny waterfalls. So we had our sprint deadline, and we pulled our backlog up, and, and off we went. So what we'd like to do is build a flow that allows people, as conscientious professionals, to choose what they're going to do next. So. Let's say, for sake of example, that this is a much more complicated, this is a value stream, these, these, these things at the top. Uh, it's the steps that you take to create value. Let's say that our value stream is really complicated. So like 10, 15 steps of going through different types of testing, different types of integration, different types of uh, preliminary and, uh, and otherwise release. And we start to notice that work is backing up in a certain spot. If we don't visualize that, then we will never have any kind of a, a depiction of the issue that's going on that we can discuss with other people. That make sense? So what we want to do with this is say, okay, you know, work's flowing along fine, and then here it backs way up. And then you can get together and you can start to say, I wonder why this is happening. You know, is, are the people at this stage incompetent? Uh, are they, you know, is, is there um, a techni technological barrier that's, that's slowing things down here? Is it because we're overstaffed in one area and understaffed in another? You know, what is it that's causing this backup? Then you come up with a hypothesis and then you test it by putting it in place for a couple of days, putting a new policy in place for a couple of days, and seeing if that gets rid of your backlog or your, your jam. So if we don't do that, this is, the, this is the trap of being a craftsman. So being a craftsman is all cool, it's wonderful, and all well and good. But when we start to think that we really know a lot about something, we start to fall prey to a whole range of cognitive biases. And one of the nastiest ones is, is one that has, it has many different names. But one of them is called the, the, the paradox of the professional where you look at a problem and you're like, I know what the solution to that is. And then you enact it, and it appears to work, and you go off and you do something else. 
and then like six weeks later it breaks and you say to somebody, why did you screw up my system? But your, your thing never actually works to begin with. And what was happening was, um, uh, you know in the beginning of The Simpsons, when you see the car driving along, and you see Maggie steering the car, and you see you turn a corner, and she turns the wheel and turns the corner, and she turns this way and turns the corner, and then all of a sudden she turns this way and the car goes that way, and it turns out that Marge was steering it all along. That's most project managers. That's most professionals. That's, that's what we do every day. When we're not actually visualizing the system that we're working on, we're working on what our assumptions of the system are. And then when things go right, we take credit for it. And when they go wrong, we blame other people. I do it too. This is what human beings do. We're fundamentally flawed, screwed up, messed up uh, objects. Uh, never hire humans. They're incredibly <laughs> So this other one here is uh, this other any pattern that I have here is called Shut Up and Leave Me Alone. And I kind of got to that a little bit. When you sequester a team and you don't let the team talk to the rest of the company, then you're not allowing the team to actually be part of the company. And after a while, they become more and more isolated. A lot of times when Tony Ann and I are brought in to work with companies, the people will say, well, we had these coders and they were completely insane. So we sent them off to get agile training, and now they're insane 20 times faster. <laughs> now they're really, really insane. And the reason is because before no one knew how to talk to them, and then they brought in a new management paradigm that ensured that you couldn't talk to them. So one of the other things that we like to do with the board is to basically say, you know, it's not just the coders looking at the board, and it's not just the middle managers looking at the board, it's anybody that walks by the board who's looking at the board. So now, rather than VPs one day freaking out and saying, I wonder where this project is, everybody stop working, come in and talk to me. They can come over and they can look at it and say, oh, I see where the project is. And they can you know, pull something off and they can say, oh, this is interesting, I, I didn't expect this. Why is this here? So all of a sudden you're having conversations about real stuff and not about fear. And one of the other things I'll say is it, it, it's obvious that I have opinions. Um, but one of the things I will say about anybody who wants to try and use a Kanban to, to help manage their work is don't do anything different. Right? Set the Kanban up initially to describe exactly what's going on now, and then watch how work flows. And if work flows calmly and smoothly and everybody's happy with it, then that's cool. And if not, then start to change the things that are breaking down. But one of the issues that we have, that we, a lot of the organizations that we go into, I should say, they'll say things like, well, you know, we're in month 12 of our, of our scrum conversion, and basically it's not working. And you're like, well, Frankly, how can Scrum not work? Because all you're really doing is picking a bunch of crap, doing it, and then picking a bunch of crap, and then doing that, and then picking a bunch of crap, and then doing that, and then picking a bunch of crap, and then doing that. <clears throat> fundamentally, Scrum cannot fail, because fundamentally, that should really be all it is. Um, but what happens is there's so many rules that are attached to that simple idea that people spend all of their, they spin their wheels trying to make sure that they're, they're performing all of the rituals and all of the rules right. And a lot of those aren't good cultural fits. And a lot of times, and this is true for any cultural change, cultural change, people, some people say, you know, it has to come from the bottom up. And other people say, oh, it has to come with blessing from the top down. And it's like, basically, it has to, it has to be an emergent system. If you can set up an emergent system for cultural change, it will likely work. But if you set up a system where anybody in that chain of command feels like they're threatened, they're going to work at cross purposes to, for, uh, to, your, to your cultural change. This last one's my favorite. As I said, I was an urban planner, so I like planning big things. Um, 
And I also believe what Eisenhower said, which is plans are useless and planning is indispensable. So I hate plans, but planning's awesome. <laughs> uh, you should really know what you're going to do and why. Uh, I'm crazy. I just think that's a good idea. So. Um, we've, read, we've run in this from, from both sides, where we've gone into Agile groups, and they say, well, we don't do any planning because we're Agile. And I'm like, oh, that hurts. So then we go through this transformation, and then I tell them about Lean, and they're like, yay, and they you know, dance around the fire, and they drink the Kool-Aid, and everything's great. And then I come back about six months later, and they say, well, we don't do planning because we're Lean. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, um, The role of planning and the methodology that you use for planning is probably going to be as unique as your, as your process is, and as unique as your product is, and as unique as your team is, and as unique as your company is, and the vertical in which your company operates, and the uh, opportunities that are coming to your, to your company. All of these things make up the social system of the product that you're creating. And so having static management techniques of any type scares me. So I mentioned rules. Um, and before I did any of these things, I was an angry punk rocker. So if you just imagine me for a moment as an angry punk rocker, uh, jumping up and down and playing the bass and stuff, I'm sure after this it's not difficult. Um, but it's a, you know, it, the big thing there was, you know, to, you know, crush the state and question authority and blah, 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 blah. For a personal Kanban, we have two rules, and that's to visualize your work and to limit your work in progress. And that's it. You can build other things on top of that, but what we want to do is set a minimal amount of constraints on a group and then let the group find the constraints that are natural for the group itself. So you need, you need minimal constraints, otherwise you don't have a system at all. You just, you know, you have uh, anarchy in the bad sense of the word. Um, and you don't want that. But you do want something that's just going to say, you know what, if you just look at what you're doing and do less so that you can calm down a little bit and not multitask and not overload yourselves, uh, you're going to find that you're going to build better product you're going to make better decisions, and you're going to think a whole lot more about your process because you actually have time to think about your process. Um, there was one company that we worked with where um, they had a 15 teams. Or actually, at that time, they had 30 teams. And um, so the first couple of days we were there, it was basically just mad dash from stand-up meeting to stand-up meeting. And um, you go to the first stand-up meeting and it goes fine, the second stand-up meeting goes fine, the third stand-up meeting goes fine, but fourth and fifth, sixth, you started to see some people that you'd seen before, You're like, oh, that's cool, they're going to each other's stand-up meetings and whatnot. But then after a while, you started getting teams that were completely comprised of other teams that you'd seen before. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, at one point, you know, John would be here and then there'd be like this person that had like John's spleen, but it had like Mary's heart and, you know, uh, they, so I started, I started asking people, I said, you know, how many teams are you guys on? And they said, oh, not that many, like four or five. <laughs> and I said, that's kind of scary. We should probably have a conversation about that. So then working with one of the teams, and while I'm working, because, you know, coders can never stop screwing with stuff. So I look over, and this guy's typing away. And I'm like, that doesn't look like your project, what is that? And he says, oh, that's third tier support. You know, support needed some help and uh, I'm, I'm fixing something really quickly for them. I said, how often do you do that? He said, oh, not, not that much, like six or eight hours a month, a week. And I was like, Jesus Christ. So I was like, okay, so I get everybody together and I say, look, you know, you guys have way too much work in progress. And so I started to go through this whole thing about how that was going to slow them down. It was why their three month projects were all nine months late. And, um, and they were all really mad. They were mad at themselves because they were such bad estimators because they knew that this, this project should only take three months. And here, they were literally nine months late. And, um, and they, you know, a three-month project people have been working on for a year. And so I started telling them about this, and then somebody says, well, you know, that's not what we spend most of our time doing. 
which of course scared the hell out of me. I said, well, what, what, what do you spend most of your time doing? And they said, this was a financial services firm. And they said, well, the traders will call us from the floor and ask us for favors. <laughs> so how often do you do that? And I said, oh, 10 to 20 hours a week. At which point, almost every product owner in the room said, you do what? <laughs> So no, no one knew that this was going on except everybody was doing it. And these were like little five or ten minute jobs that these guys were picking up like constantly. And so I was thinking like, why, why would somebody do that? If you're, already, if you're working on a bunch of three month projects and you already feel like crap because they're, they're, they've been going on for a year, and you're doing third tier support, and you're going to constant meetings where people are berating you because your projects are so late, which is probably taking up another you know six to ten hours of their week. Um, which you know by now you can see they were there pretty late at night. Um, why would they take on extra work? And the reason was because they were craftsmen. They needed to finish something. And they didn't give a shit what it was. They didn't care if it blew all of their other projects out of the water, and it couldn't because they totally lost faith that they could complete any of the projects. So they had to take on these little tiny things just to have an iota of professional security. And they had to hide the fact that they were doing it. Now I've got everybody on that, that company down to about, most of them are at one or two projects each. Uh, in the last six months, they've completed like nine projects, and they don't believe it. So they keep going back and looking for technical debt in their work, and they can't find it. Um, and it was not an easy sell to go to anybody in that company and to say, look, you guys, you're doing too much work. And the only way you're going to finish things is to do dramatically less. And the people that fought the most to keep the heavy workload were the coders themselves. Because you start to identify with all those projects that you get. You put your professionalism into it, you put your soul into it, you put your heart into it, and you don't want to give it up. And so if you had, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you've got, you know, this kid, this kid, this kid, and this kid. Uh, four kids is too much to pay attention to. Which two are you going to set on the shelf for a while and, and deal with the two of these two? You know, and then raise them and then, you know, raise these other kids. And it was really hard to get through to everybody what that was. And basically, I had to where we had to um, batter them. <laughs> we, had, we had to beat them until they, uh, until they, and we did that by basically putting them through exercise after exercise after exercise, and they still didn't get it. So it's like, okay, well, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we spend one day focused on one project? You know, just ignore all your other projects, everything else, because you'll get to them tomorrow, just this one day. And everybody went through one day, and by the end of the day, they were completely freaking out. Because they'd done more work in one day on that one project than they'd done in, like, in six to eight months before that. Um, the beauty of being able to visualize this stuff is that when you start to find yourself in a situation where you're overloaded, uh, where your team is overloaded, where you're uncertain about the future of a project, you now have something to go to to discuss that with. So before, whenever everybody was, when people were just taking on work and taking on work and taking on work, it had no physical form, it had no shape. So they would just allow themselves to take on more and more and more of this ephemeral stuff. It was like, of course I can do that because I want to. They had no idea what their actual capacity is, but now here we're actually setting up a capacity. Is it sometimes a fake capacity? Yes. Is it a false um, capacity? Yes. Is it a million, million times less false than having no idea what your capacity is at all? Yes. So my thing about this is 
that there's always going to be something wrong about your board, and that's a good thing. Because it keeps us asking what's really going on and what we're really doing. And if we don't pay attention to our processes, then we might be coders, but we're not craftsmen. How am I doing for time? You're doing great. I'm doing great. You're doing okay. great. And how much time do I have left? Um, you can go for another 15 minutes if you want okay. to, or you can stop whenever you're ready and take right. questions. So I will do one more thing. Um, it's kind of what I ended with. Uh, you'll notice that not, the things didn't come off of there in order and no one died. Um, here, here's another thing. No one died. Um, we're all still here. Um, I had some teams freak out because they couldn't figure out what they could possibly do when they put too many things in this column. Well, what's happened here is right now, everybody in this room that's actually looking at the board or can see it, you're having an internal struggle with yourself because this number is bigger than this number. <laughs> you're having this horrible Sesame Street violent moment where you know you, you want to just take that thing out of there because it's, so that's all the enforcement we need, right? That's really all the enforcement we need. So right now we've got this thing down here, it's like, oh my God, what is that? And the thing is, is that whatever this is, it's fine that it's here, it just better damn well be important enough to be here, right? So if you're Getty and uh, you, know, you lose half your, half your servers, You've lost half your servers. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get to you next week when I'm done. With <laughs> you know, uh, the deal here isn't to worship this number. And the other thing is, this number is written. <laughs> there, the number's different, <laughs> right? Um, we don't care about the artifacts of what's up here. What we care about is the flow of work. We care about making room for emergencies when emergencies come up and not having to go through all sorts of machinations around them saying, you know, well, now that this emergency's come up, you know, which of these things from our sprint planning meeting are we going to get rid of? Um, because I don't know what software companies you guys work for, but even in the best groups that I've worked with, emergencies come up all the time. And sometimes emergencies are that there's technical debt. Sometimes emergencies are the water main breaks. Sometimes it's that there's a snowstorm. Sometimes it's there, there's a flu bug and half the people have to stay home because they're sick and the other half the people have to stay home because they have sick kids. You know, whatever it might be, this is actually the norm of software development. Software development sucks. It's, it's, it's ridiculously terrible. Um, and what we could do is we could build systems that deny the fact that we have a lot of variation in our work, or we could build systems that actually adapt well to the variation that we, that we see every single day. Because ultimately, the only thing we want to do when we go to work is move crap over to here. And to move crap over here so that it doesn't come back. So I'm doing something. I have done it to a level of quality that it comes over here and doesn't come back. That is the definition of done. We have to find done. We don't have to have that conversation ever again. Done is you finish something and it doesn't come back and haunt you in the future. We have all sorts of tri tri that, tricks and tools to do that, from pair programming to unit tests to whatever. We know how to do this. The reason that it hasn't been working is because our doing columns all look like this. And we don't have enough time to focus on any one task to do a good job. Um, so I can literally talk about this stuff for four or five days straight. So at some point, I have to come up with an arbitrary stopping point, and I have chosen this one. <laughs> uh, so um, 
my, my, my closing remark just to sum everything up is you can't be a craftsperson if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. End of story. So that is my, my little presentation for this evening, and I'm open for any questions you guys might have. Yes? the argument I couldn't quite hear. Oh, sorry about that. So the, the, the question was that, um, that um, one of the common arguments about, about wanting to do Scrum over Kanban is that since Kanban apparently has no deadlines, which of course it does because life has deadlines, it's just the difference is that if you're doing a flow-based system, your deadlines actually have meaning as opposed to are randomly placed every two weeks. Um, don't people slack off and not do their work? And so one of the things that's happening here, turn around, buddy, is this. Oh, and yeah, live with it. Um, so here's the thing. We have our now four items in doing, because we have altered our stuff, because we have free will and we can do whatever the heck we want in order to build good software. Um, and um, we have four people on our team, uh, Larry, Susan, Eduardo, and, 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 and Lazy Bill. Okay? <laughs> and so we see this happening. <laughs> and after a while, somebody's going to say, Bill, dude, what? Dude. Done a million things that you've sat on your ass. What are you doing? Generally, what's happening is Bill is not lazy. Bill has a really complicated problem, mm -hmm. and Bill is a coder, which means that Bill doesn't actually talk to other people. So, <laughs> so he's back there desperately trying to solve this really complicated problem that you guys could probably swarm on almost immediately. So when you have a visual system you've also created a social enforcement mechanism that people actually do their work. But if you also get this, where it's going over here and it's done and then QA's kicking it back and QA's kicking it back and QA's kicking it back and QA's kicking it back, then you have another conversation that you can have with Bill, which is, dude, and um, then you'd say, oops, um, but what we'll start seeing is that there are certain people on your team that do really good work, and maybe some other people who don't. Before, we really only had our assumptions about who that might be. But now we actually have uh, physical, physical proof. Now, now that I've said that, I can say that I've never met this guy. Before visualization, every team has tons of these guys. After we visualize things, these guys magically disappear. I've gone into companies where people have said, you know, 
you're going to have a really hard time here because we don't really have the best staff. <laughs> and I'm like, damn. <laughs> Maybe I just better do it myself. Um, but what usually happens, and this is, this is the thing that we found, is, you know, everybody's looking for the A-list coder. You know, I want to go out and I want to hire the A-list coder. I want to find the awesomest, bestest, most amazing, lovable, huggy, furry coder in the whole world. And so they go off and they go searching for this, this creature. And sure enough, you'll find a couple of them. And I would say that you'll probably find them about 40% of the time because that's about the number of people that would be above average. <laughs> So what happens is you start hiring people, you say, oh, he was a good hire, she was a good hire, oh, she was a great hire, he was a great hire, all oh, these other guys, they were terrible. But what we found is that when people all of a sudden have this context, all those C's and D's and E's and F's and G coders that we used to have, they all start to rise up. They become, they become better. And the question is, did they really become better? Or do they finally have the information that they needed to do a good job? So the, the awesome A-list coders that we find are people who have a skill that's actually rather rare, which is they will get fed up very early when they don't know something, and they will go off to find out what, what it is. And any of us who are managers who have, have hired these people, we know that they're wonderful and the biggest pains in the asses ever. Because I'll keep going back, I'll keep going back, and say, are you sure? Did you really mean this? Oh, it's like, that doing that work. Um, so when you, uh, when you set this up, as stupid as this may seem, because it is honestly just post-it notes on a whiteboard, this gives people a lot of information. And so the, the personal Kanban book is called Mapping Work, Navigating Life. And it's called that on purpose. So what happens is, uh, if I show you guys a map of, that's not a map, unfortunately. If I show you guys a map of Puget Sound, you're going to know where you know the water is, where the land is, where the mountains are, where all the cities are, where the roads are, etc. and so forth. And you're going to know it immediately. And you're going to know everything in relation to everything else. It's going to have context. If I give you a really long list of all the crap that's attached to Puget Sound, It'd take you forever to read it, and then when you were done, you'd have no idea. It would just be a list of roads and streets. It would have no, no coherence. So what we want to do here is build a map of our work and get things out of certain tools that I shall not name by name uh, that are just listing all of our features out and not letting us see those things in actual context. Um, Did you forget? <laughs> um, no, I've, I've got two that are unrelated, so we can interleave. So back to the guys who were um, taking in this work from elsewhere that was sort of out of band. Mm -hmm. Did you just have them cut that off, or did you have them also make notes and put them up so that they could visualize what, so awesome. how massive it was? <laughs> Okay, so did everybody catch that question? Okay. Um, so, so the answer is uh, each team had a completely misleading Kanban when I arrived because it only talked about the work each team was doing. It's like, we're limiting our whip. It's like, yeah, but your people are doing 800 things. Just on this project, you're limiting your whip. Good, good for you. So what we did was we said, I want you guys to start gathering up all of the ambient work that your people are doing. So I want you to actually visualize all of the tasks that people are doing elsewhere. And so they had boards like this, but taller and longer. Um, and then they took butcher paper and put them down here in the leg area and wrote ambient work. And somewhere I've got pictures of this, where up here you've got like three or four <laughs> stickies, and then down here is like a hula skirt. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is obscene and poetic and beautiful and something that only someone who didn't actually have to live through it would love. Um, but yes, um, when somebody's in that situation, I like to have them visualize things. And one of the things I can note with that is like, let's say that I draw this up 
and I have this backlog box here, and this is my backlog box. I've noticed that people do this. Oh, I'm building my backlog. This is the work I got to do. Here I go. This is great. I'm in control. And oh my god, I've got too much work. So I've noticed that regardless of what arbitrary size people draw up, as soon as they fill it up, that's their definition of too much work. I love it. So I try and get people to make understand the business need for the things that they're creating. So let's say over here, there's this huge backlog column that's 100,000 miles long. It's an entire JIRA long, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here what we can do is we have a column that we'll call ready. And ready will be the prioritized or the, the tasks that the group is that whatever methodology the team has, has chosen to provide, these are the ones that they have called to do in the immediate future. Um, and I, this, is, this is actually really important because the ready column eight, we can actually give this a limit. So um, at the beginning of all of this, in downtown Seattle, uh, David Anderson and Corey Lattice at, um, at Corbis had this problem. And the problem was that um, there were multiple vice presidents giving work to one group of developers. And all of those vice presidents had the same political power, and all the developers didn't. So as a developer, you'd sit there and you'd type in a way, and you'd think, ah, I'm doing some good work, and then a random vice president would show up and say, why aren't you working on my thing? And he's like, well, because I'm, I don't care, just work on my thing. So you'd switch to his thing, type along, and another vice president would come up, and after two or three times, nothing was getting done. Right? So what they did was they set up the, the ready column, which at that time was probably called backlog, because we were all just babes in the wood about the stuff at the time. And it had a number. And it said, you freaking vice presidents, you put in here what you think, as a group, is the most important stuff for you to get done. And sure enough, you know, they're running along and everything's going well, and everything's fine. And then one day, somebody pulls this ticket from here, and it goes over here, and it ends up being a horrible idea. I mean, a terrible thing to do. That no longer had to be a fight between the development staff and management. It, because now, these tickets, which were previously free, it was just the cost of going down and yelling. Now, all of a sudden, all of these tickets are part of an economy. And if you want to have something in this group of eight, you have to sell all the other vice presidents in its value. Right? So depending on the, the cultural makeup of the group, of the political um, structure of the company, of the uh, ways that the groups might work with each other, you might have amazingly different types of work in set. And this is another reason why having a two-week time box can be dangerous for these types of teams because they're, type, they're, they're working in a political environment that doesn't care about Scrum, right? It cares about whatever it is that it cares about. And so also, if you have these eight things, and then all of a sudden one day something, something happens, and you need to replace it, it doesn't matter because it's just a thing, right? Now, I'll circle back really quickly. You can have regular release dates, 
where you release whatever it is that's gotten over there to done. You're still going to have trade shows and conferences and uh, you know South by Southwest or whatever that you need to get your thing done by. So you're still going to have real deadlines. You're still going to have real shipment dates. You're still going to have real stuff that business really does. But now you're actually working on the natural and real deadlines of the business and you're not working on deadlines that you've made up. So the history here, lest I seem overly bitchy, is before Agile, people would do this. They would say, you know, I have 400, I have a crazy ass idea. I'm gonna give it to BA who doesn't know what they're doing. And the BA will sit there and manically type up features. Then they'll load them into a dump truck and then they'll go beep, 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 and then they'll dump it on your desk, and then they'll say, I'm going to come back in 12 months, and I expect to see that thing done. So that was, that was waterfall. It didn't work very well. So Agile came as a response to that. It was an evolution in software development, and it is awesome. Right? I did awesome things at doing Agile that I never could have done uh, with my traditional waterfall projects. But, there are now evolutions that are happening beyond that. So I'm never going to say that Agile wasn't a good idea and that it wasn't useful and stuff. What I am going to say is that some of the artifacts that we've developed around Agile are actually working at cross purposes to what we originally wanted. And that um, we can do better. Yes? Can you say Scrum instead of Agile? Because this is certainly Agile. Those ah, I couldn't agree more. So, yes, I'll just totally agree with that. The, the reason that um, uh, the reason that uh, oh, I could go on for hours about that. <laughs> you could uh, argue that this still matches the manifesto. Um, yes, yes it does. Uh, and in fact, for one of the scrum gatherings, uh, I had a t-shirt made up that said, uh, uh, people over process except when that process is scrum. Um, <laughs> so, I thought the point behind having iterations is having a point where you could check in and say, here's a set of features I can demonstrate. Yes. And not wanting to say, borrow the, bother the busy managers and analysts more often. So you're not running to them every day when you come, you move a card to Dutch. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at my, the same my, time, frequently enough, that steering is possible. Yes, and so what I would say to that is that you're doing thematic releases. It may take three days, it may take four weeks, it may take two weeks. It, you know, they, they will take a natural amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's what I use to replace the coherence that you're you're looking for. What I've also found is that most Scrum teams and unfortunately also most XP teams didn't actually have coherent releases at the end of their iterations. They just had a bunch of crap that they developed over the last two weeks and then they would demo it. And then you, the thing is, is that we sell things by stories and that gives the, you know, the managers, it frustrates the managers because you're not giving them a coherent story. So I would go with a thematic release and then just see when that, when that theme is actually going to be completed. Twelve months. Well, well yeah. then, uh, then what I would say is that uh, both Agile and Lean preach small batches. And um, that in general, what I would say is uh, if you're married and you would feel uncomfortable going that long without seeing your spouse, that's too long a development cycle. If you're not married, you can just develop all <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, traditional development problem in exploratory work. You have the ever-growing card, and then fitting the X shape into some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on the ever-growing card? And yes. Just to deal with the ever-growing. Yes. So I believe that there are probably three kinds of ever-growing cards. There's the we didn't realize that that was just that big. There was the, um, there's the, this is technologically 
and uh, operationally more complex than we expected it to be. And there is the, we're partnering with somebody who is utterly screwing us up. <laughs> so, we have our system here, and we have work coming along, and everything's kind of moving. And, um, and then one day somebody notices, you know, this card has been here an awfully long time. And hopefully it wouldn't be there an awfully long time, it would be there just slightly longer than we're comfortable with. So as we get used to what that, that natural flow is, a couple of things are going to happen. One is that the rest of the team is going to notice that the card's there, so we're going to discuss it earlier. And the people who are doing the card are going to become less tolerant with not being able to move it. So if you think of this like a game, and the game is to, to move these cards as fast as responsibly possible. So that, again, it comes over here and it doesn't come back. Because I think every developer in the world knows that they have, without having the cards, they have moved cards that they're like, this is going to come back and bite me in the ass later. Never move a card like that. <laughs> um, we, we, we tend to think that technical debt comes from like technical debt monster that like lives in like under the under the Fremont Bridge or something. Uh, but we, we built it ourselves. <laughs> it's all us, right? So um, when you have this ever-growing card, so this, this card is down here, and all of a sudden it's looming, and it's getting bigger and it's bigger, then you start to have conversations. So the first thing you say is, why is this card like this? We have an outside resource that's absolutely driving us crazy. Okay, well then, how do we how do we visualize the cost that that outside resource is is, is, in, is bringing to us? You know, do we do we put out another column here that's called you know those bastards <laughs> and put the card in there, and then every day you just draw the number of dollar signs for how much money it's costing <laughs> the company. And then after it has, you know, it's totally covered in dollar signs, then you can take it to your boss and say, these guys are costing us millions of dollars. Can we please get somebody else? Um, if it is a, a, a complex problem, so, um, and no, I'm not going to talk about Kinect. Uh But um, we will, we have a tendency um, to believe that this is one of the, re the, the reasons I have a problem with, with planning poker, is human beings fall prey to something called the planning fallacy. And the planning fallacy, uh, in short, it just says that we really suck at planning. Um, and the uh, little law that goes along with it is called Hofstetter's Law, which says human beings will underestimate every task they're given, even if they're aware of Hofstetter's Law. Um, what happens is when, when we get a task and we estimate it, the first thing we think is, how long would this take me? And I don't know about you guys, but I have a really high opinion of myself. <laughs> so I'm dangerous when, when given a task like this. And so then the next thing I think is, well, the last time I did this task, I did it in six hours, but I was interrupted a couple of times, and now I know what to do, so I bet this time I can do it in four. So you'll estimate it at four. And what you really aren't doing is you aren't recognizing the fact that it really does take six hours because we're always interrupted that many times. But we also assume that it's going to be, that we're going to do a good job at solving this problem. And as we all know, uh, software development gives us the ever-growing card, which is this problem that just says, you know, you thought I was this big, but I'm actually a post-it pad. Um, and what we can do then is we have to start having conversations. So um, one of the things that I'll, that go really nicely the first time. Um, um, one of the things that happens, I can reuse this kind of. So at this time we have the time. Um, we have time, and then we have time to complete. 
So over the course of our project, we're completing tasks. And um, that. And so we start to do things like, you can start to, you, with a Kanban, you can measure how long it really takes you to complete things by simply noting when you started it and when you finished it. Isn't that crazy? Um, and basically what it is, is, is you are actually acknowledging the fact that it, it really does take you time to complete things. So you start to note on a graph how long it takes you to complete things. And, um, And what you'll start to notice is these are the cards that we hate, right? These are the ever-growing cards. But what we'll notice is that we'll start to notice those things around here, and we can start having conversations around that. This is the conversation like, I'm feeling uncomfortable about this card. Okay, work on it a little bit more and tell me what you find. I find that this card scares the crap out of me. <laughs> Um, and then you can start saying why, but you know, you can, you, you know, however long, but then basically what happens is you start on what you think is a task and it ends up becoming a spike. And you can drive this spike up as far as this task is worth. And at some point you're going to get to a point where this task is going up and it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. And then at some point somebody's going to have to make a decision that says we've sunk too much into this, we have to do something else. Yeah, is that five minutes? Okay. I thought you were waving at me. You're very friendly. Um, so these conversations, you know, and when, when we, people say, like, the first thing that anybody does when they approach a task is to size it. And then we go, we've gone crazy in Scrum trying to come up with different ways to size things that we won't get penalized for. Um, and if you want to really get me started, start me talking about velocity. Uh, we'll be here all night. Um, but so while we're running up this, this level, uh, what, I, what I found is that we have two, two things. So let's, like, let's say we do a statistical analysis of all of these dots. We find out here, that, you know, this is like, you know, we know with 85% certainty that anything you give us, we're going to complete in this much time or less. Um, we know that sometimes things take a little bit longer, and sometimes things are absolutely obscene. In general, we're really good at knowing two gradations of things, reasonable and insane. And so if somebody comes to you and says, I have a bunch of tasks for you, and you look through them, you can, and you just want to divide them up into reasonable and insane, you can do that really well. One, three, five, seven story points, you can't do it. Um, and there's another cognitive bias that relates to that. Um, which is called um, comparison bias, or discrepancy bias. And discrepancy bias basically means that whenever anybody does anything, the first thing that we do is we start to compare them. So right now, you are all suffering from comparison bias, or from discrepancy bias. So it's like, this is in his left hand, this is in his right hand, this is on my left, right side, and this is on his left side. Um, this is green, and this is black. This one's upside down. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, when we do things on the Fibonacci scale, we spend a lot of our time focused on whether or not things are at that smallest gradation where they really don't matter. Because just like some things will become an ever-growing card, those threes and fives, they become each other all the time. Yeah. OK, I believe that that is about five minutes, or can I do one more question? Is there one more question? Is it a short one? Is there well, a short question? The only reason I ask is because we kind of said we'd wrap up a certain time, and if some people have to go, okay. you're welcome to hang out and talk some more, and we can ask you about velocity after <laughs> we've given people permission. Oh, danger, Robinson. Uh, okay, yes? Do you have an iPhone app that you like for personal Um, No. <laughs> uh, actually, um, the the, one of the problems is that I don't have an iPhone, uh, so I've had a hard time evaluating them. Uh, we had an iPhone app, and uh, uh, iOS kept improving, 
and it improved so fast that we couldn't keep up with it. So after a while, I just took it off the market. Um, but what I can say is um, that Lean Kit Kanban has uh, an iPhone uh, interface and that um, Kanbanery has an iPhone interface. And I, I really like them both. Uh, so Lean Kit is really great if you have a really um, robust Kanban that you want to track. Uh, and you want some like really like killer enterprise scale stuff from it. Uh, Kanbanery is really really nice for personal use. It's it's uh, very pretty. Um, it's it's created by wonderful people. Actually, they're, they're both teams are, are quite wonderful people. Um, and so those are probably the two that I would I would recommend. And um, Janice, do you have a list of them? Um, so thank you.